Hello, everyone, and welcome to this very special episode of The Late Drop presented by Future Fins. It's special for two reasons. First reason is I'm going to be speaking to Mikey Red, uh, Mikey O'Shaughnessy, uh, about the horrific wipeout at Pipeline on the Valentine's Day swell. Um, we're also going to talk about his upbringing uh, on the Big Island, how he moved to Oahu to chase uh, his surfing dream. And the other special reason, number two, is we're going to highlight and uh, put a link up for the North Shore Lifeguard Association so you guys can go and donate to the North Shore Lifeguards uh, for what they do in and out of the water. Uh, they are the guardian angels for everyone in the ocean um, uh, in Hawaii. And with me, I have Dave Wassell, a uh, long time uh, big wave charger and North Shore Lifeguard. And, and I just want to have Dave explain uh, when you do donate, um, what that money goes to, what it goes towards, and how it helps the you know, North Shore lifeguards um, help us in the water. Thanks, James. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, first of all, yeah, you're not going to see the lifeguards walking around with a brand new set of shoes or anything like that. All the money goes straight back into the community. Our, our mission statement is simple. Uh, we're, we're there to protect the public, but Furthermore, we want to actually educate and promote ocean safety, and we do that through our junior lifeguard program. Uh, we're very fortunate that over the past 21 years, we've had great people, uh, anyone from the Florence Brothers, Eli Olson, uh, Jack Johnson. Those are some of the more famous names who have been junior lifeguards. But through that, we get uh, individuals who become lifeguards in the future. Um, and so that's where that money goes. Uh, it, it doesn't go to us. It goes back to the community. And we're very proud to be able to do that and offer the kids something to do during the summertime. You know, idle hands can lead to wrongdoing. So we keep them busy. Parents are stoked. When the kids come home, they're tired and educated. Yeah, I, I can attest to the Junior Lifeguard Program. I've been down the pipeline. I've actually helped out um, through, the, through the week there in summer times. And the beauty, beautiful thing about this is that some of the money that you may donate, help the junior lifeguard program, that kid that's doing that may save your life down the track one time. So it's a beautiful thing. Please uh, check out the link, click on it, donate if you can. Uh, we appreciate you, Dave. We appreciate the North Shore lifeguards. Uh, and I hope you really enjoy the episode um, with Mikey O'Shaughnessy, aka Mikey Red. Thank you. I always get the first wave. Pretty much, I it brought me to tears, like the wave was so good. That's the biggest drop I've ever taken in my life. And so right there, I told myself I needed to just relax and stay calm, that I'm stronger than this. Well, Mikey O'Shaughnessy, Aka, Mikey Red, good to see you, my man. I mean, what a... What a heavy situation the other week, and uh, what a what a month after the the jaws the jaws wipe out, and and uh, obviously the the Valentine's the pipe one day. Um, I, I want to dive into that deeper, but first off, just give us a rundown on how you how you're feeling, how your health's going, and um, how yeah how everything's moving on from that day. Right on, Jamie. Uh, yeah, just. So thankful to be alive and, and just gratitude to the fullest for all my guardian angels, for all my rescuers and um, all the choices and everything that kind of helped me stay alive. There were so many different factors that I got really blessed and lucky with to be here right now. So yeah, life is a trip and just taking it day by day, moment by moment as it comes and just focusing on the healing um i'm not really leaving the house right now i'm just literally staying in the living room curtains are down and just trying to stay sedated a lot of thc and just rest yeah yeah well that's good man it's, it's super super stoked to hear and like i said we'll we'll dive we'll dive into that whole situation a little bit later but um you know, you you've definitely been one of the underground charges for a long time, and uh, and I wanted to, and I know you're from the Big Island, so I'd like to go back and start start from there. You know, um, you know, what was it like, you know, growing up on the Big Island, and um, sort of just, you know, just transition into that. Yeah, right on. The underground is is it's a hard place to get out of, but yeah, the Big Island, the foundation over there, that's where I was born and raised, and 
growing up on the big island as a kid it was living the dream you know um i grew up on the coastline of puna paddling outrigger canoe really competitively and yeah that's my foundation so when i wasn't surfing or the waves weren't good i was i was in the canoe either racing or practicing and and my brothers my parents all my best friends the whole community is at the canoe halau so yeah it's just wouldn't change it for anything um just yeah um, it's small towns over there the surf isn't like incredible we don't have any world-renowned waves but there is a lot of uh fun user-friendly waves and then we got all kind of slabs and heavy stuff like that but yeah not everybody's all into that game so just trying to like surround myself with my brothers and my heroes and the guys that are really paving the way to lead me into this whole lifestyle yeah one thing i get from the from all the guys that i know from the big island um is that you know like you said it's not a it's not like the north shore or maybe even like Kauai or maui where there's just a ton of accessible waves and it seems like you guys have to be really resourceful and you know as a kid it must be awesome because it seems like you know whether it's spear fishing or fishing or hunting or just exploring it you know the coastline of the big island is so just rugged and raw and like you said you know it's it's such a small town i'm guessing that even like maybe the other big sports like football and baseball maybe don't come in into it as much you know so you guys are just sort of growing up like just like i said like just hunting and fishing and just just you know making mischief around the beach and the mountains you know would that be correct in sort of saying that yep keiki okaina children of the land um a lot of the kids and people i grew up with um they're not all surfers like not everybody is ocean orientated even a lot of hawaiian people so like you said fishing hunting canoe paddling all these other things like instead of normal sports like football and baseball but that being said we we got all those too just you know the small town and the small communities it's it's, it's hard to get out of sometimes yeah it's like island fever you got everything right there and uh just yeah you're, you're comfortable and and it's beautiful it's it's there's always challenges and and the community is second to none so it's all family and and people who really care about each other for the most part and and what and you know growing up as a, over there as a kid you know like what, what age did you start to surf and i know you got a bunch of brothers like you know, were you following in their footsteps? Were they surfers? Were you sort of like chasing after them? Or how, how did you get into, into surfing? Um, yeah, so my oldest brother, Dallas, he's my ultimate hero and he led me to be who I am right now. So um, without him, I wouldn't be living on the North Shore. I would probably be on the Big Island uh, still figuring it out. Um, I was kind of hard-headed growing up in school like wasn't the favorable in class and the scholar so just kind of follow my heart and do what i believe is right so the, thank god the ocean and and the community had my back so my brothers and and of course like his name is dallas and and he grew up with ikaika kalama and kelly mamala so like we we had a crew for sure that um motivated and and had each other's backs and that's what it's all about is teamwork um as you know like it's not really uh i mean big wave surfing surfing is a solo selfish sport but for the most part you're never alone so thank god for for those guys that paved the way for me and and yeah just led me into this arena yeah, I was, I was going to say, I'd written some name downs of, uh, you know, people, like guys from the Big Island that, that I, I'd, I'd remembered. And, and, you know, Kaika was at the top of my list because he's such a phenomenal waterman. Obviously, the Kalama name, the heritage of that name and, you know, Uncle Boogie and then, you know, Dave and it just it goes on and on. And obviously, Kia Lee and, uh, 
you know, like uh, Aaron Golds from the Big Island, obviously, you know, Shano, Shane Dorian and Tori Meister. You know, there's a ton of really good, amazing surfers and, and watermen and, uh, you know, and to, and to hear you say that you grew up canoe paddling because, you know, I, I know a lot of people in Hawaii, obviously, but I think a lot of the surfers and, and people that sort of come to Hawaii don't really understand that canoe paddling is the Hawaiian state sport. You know, it's a, ma- it's a massive sport and, you know, through school and, and everything, you know, and, uh, and I've been to some of those regattas, you know, um, I paddled in a couple of those uh, state regattas where they go down to the Kihi Lagoon and, and just just race all day up and down and then, you know, long distance season culminating obviously in Molokai. And, and I, and I know recently that, uh, you know, the big Island had a, uh, a, a Red Bull sponsored um, team over there that was hammers, man. They were like one of the best teams in the world, you know? And uh, so I was really stoked to, you know, hear that you grew up, you know, canoe paddling as well. Cause it's such a good foundation. Cause you, um, learn to work as a team, you know, you got to blend together and, and you can't let, you know, let people down. You got to turn up for practice. It's a really good way to, um, you know, to start Build your community. Yeah? yeah. You as yourself, excuse me, sorry, but yeah, you're one of the most legendary paddlers. So to be around you and learn from you is, is huge for me too. You've always inspired me and motivated me, but yeah, like you said, year round regatta then one man season then six man long distance so to have that um as my foundation you know being a steersman i feel really lucky to have that guiding me in the surf world yeah so when was it mikey that you uh you know obviously we you know everyone loves surfing you like growing up you know it's just because it's just something that you do because everyone's doing it but you know, when, when, was there was there a moment that you were like, "Hey, you know, like I'm sort of pretty good, pretty good at surfing," or you know, you saw someone that was like maybe like a Shano that was like on the tour, and you're like, "Was there a, a moment when you thought like dream, like wow, maybe, maybe I want to do this, or maybe this is something I want to like, you know, do?" Or when when did that sort of start to enter your mind? Yeah, pretty much um, ever since I can remember, that's all I wanted to do was be a professional surfer and surf big waves. Um, growing up under my brother's reins and Ikaika, Keali'i, Kainoa Haonio, these guys have given me their dream in a way. And um, yeah, ever since I can remember, I've always wanted to live on the North Shore, surf pipeline, and be invited to the Eddie Aikau. Like, every kid growing up in Hawaii that surfs, pretty sure we all have the same dream. And uh, it depends on the individual. A lot of others, like, have different circumstances, and and uh, they get there a little easier. But um, for myself, I've just never given up my personal goals, my personal legend. And, uh, yeah, just, um, so grateful for this life because it's a healthy, beautiful life. It's living the dream. We're living the dream, getting to surf every day and, and yeah, just, it's tough out there for sure. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say too, it like coming from, from the big Island, it must, there must be the, the, the challenges in itself. And I think that um you know anyone that knows knows but just maybe elaborate on what like what are the challenges like coming from you know an outer island like the big island then having to like you know uh try and make it you know to where you can potentially make a living or chase those dreams yeah coming from the the big island the odds are pretty much same as you coming from australia You know, same as others coming from around the world. I'm not a local in this uh, pecking order. So growing up in Hawaii definitely have certain advantages. But uh, being raised around like Hawaiian communities, it's all about respect. You give and then you get. So yeah, just so thankful for all that values instilled in my life. And uh, yeah, just trying to... Now I live here for half my life um, since I was 16 
and um, it's it's been life changing. It's it's been I'm literally living the dream, like I said. So it's a struggle. I'm I'm having hard hard times, just like everybody else in the world, but trying to stay positive and just listen to my heart. Yeah. And so you mentioned 16. So I'm guessing that that was uh, you finished high school on the Big Island and then decided to go to the North Shore. Or how did that work out? Yeah. So like I said, I was kind of a, a hard-headed kid growing up, really kolohe, and learned the hard way, basically. So school was in my forte once I kind of got the gist of reading, writing, basic math. I kind of just was like fixated my sights on the North Shore. So I dropped out of high school, moved to the North Shore at 16 and just got like basically the worst jobs that you can get. Dishwashing, just any job really to, you know, pursue my dream out in the ocean. Pipeline, Jaws, Chopo. So yeah, just trying to take it step by step and uh, take notes along the ways. And um yeah, with my own formula and my own plan, just trying to get the best waves out there. And how how, how was that? You know, because there's a lot of people that, you know, do come to Hawaii, you know, whether it's from around the world or, you know, from you know, outer islands, they, you know, obviously the North Shore is the Mecca. So how did, how did you go about trying to, you know, work yourself up in that pecking order and to, to getting waves at certain spots and, yeah, how did you, how did how did you go about that? Um, yeah, so it started like when I was fourteen, you know, just kind of learning from the best, Ikaika, Kelly, my brother. So they had like, you know, skills that are second to none. So when I was over here, or when I made the transition, I had a lot of help for sure. But um, like a lot of other people coming here with not much financial help or stability. So just trying to balance a regular life on top of trying to, you know, get into that pecking order and get the waves that I visualize. Um, it's, it's been so hard. Like it's, it's doggy dog out here. It's crazy. Nobody man. really wants to share. Nobody wants to give you their secrets. So you're out there trying to figure it out for the most part. Coming from the big island, we ain't, we don't got no pipeline, we don't got no jaws. So coming here to the North Shore and, you know, the big crowd, the pecking order, like, I didn't get shit for the first 10 years, you know, five years at least till, like, getting recognized. Oh, this guy's actually from Hawaii. So, yeah, just trying to do it politely respectfully and at the same time not really caring who's like at out there at the same time yeah it's a, it's a fine line right because you <sighs> like you know a lot of the people i've had on the podcast obviously have, you know have sponsors or you know are able to pick windows to go so you because know, pipeline's such a it's you know like it's that you know what they say the 50 yard line it's the beach and you got all the best guys that converge and and, you know, they'll be at the houses and it's, you know, it's big, but it's not that good. Then the wind switches and it's on, you know, and, and then someone will go out and maybe get an insane wave and that just kickstarts their career. But if you don't have that, like if you're not able to hang at the houses or you're working a job and you're trying to pick your windows around when you think the swell is going to be its best, then that's generally when the whole world's out there as well, right? So... So it's sort of, it's really good to speak to someone that, you know, is, uh, hasn't had it all given to him or, and has had to really work for, for what you've got. And not, not saying that other people haven't, but like you mentioned, you know, just everyone has their different journeys in life, you know, and your journey is different than everyone else's and, and it's a cool journey. And, um, it's good to see that you've, you've, you haven't given up. You're still not giving up. You've had lots of successes along the way, but it's really cool to, um, to hear that, you know, like just putting in that time and effort and not being deterred by going out and sitting there for three hours and getting absolutely zero and then having the mental fortitude to go, I'm going to go do that again and again and again and get nothing and get nothing. And then, um, you know, it's a tough gig. 
heck yeah, it's life and death out there. So you don't want to make any mistakes. Equipment, positioning, timing, as you know, like it's life and death. So for me, like just trying to make all my decisions like calculated where I'm like all in. I'm, you know, I've, I'm confident in my choice. My, yeah, but like you said, that takes time. So just trying to put in the time. And uh, yeah, I've been over here for 12 years now and, and uh, still living the dream. And then what's, um, you know, when was it from, because like, you know, you can distinguish big waves to big waves, right? Like, you know, pipes, a big wave, like sunsets, a big wave. And then you've got out of reefs, swine me out. You know, when did, when did you, you know, you've moved to the North Shore. Obviously, I'm guessing the focus was on pipe, right? It's, it usually is from anyone trying to make a name for himself. Now, did you also at that stage when you move over, you're like, okay, like I'm going to focus on pipe, but I'm also going to paddle out the Waimea. I want to start to get to that next level, big waves as well. Like what was that like? Yeah, so I didn't really know about all these other waves. But for sure, I was fixated on Pipeline and Waimea. I, like every decision, every move I make is, you know, around these waves. So all the other ones are a bonus. But the same day Pipeline is good, generally Waimea is not going to be good. So like, you know, it's just a bonus. And um, yeah, I, I think I've always had the same goals and appetite for surf and big wave surfing um i was lucky like with my brothers and ikaika and Kelly, like to be around the jet ski evolution and when i was a young teenager i was learning all that stuff how to drive and and tow with the best so once i moved over here 16 like it was game on i just had to jump through the hoops of you know balancing a regular life with a you know regular job and all that but um, yeah, the North Shore is like the Mecca. If you want to make a name for yourself or, you know, surf pipeline, you got to be over here. So yeah, just going home or like being over here, I have to be over here the whole season. It's too hard to go back and forth. So with the resting part of things and then just trying to score every swell and the right timing, and be a standout, that's my goals. Yeah, and when did you, did you, you know, I know you like going to Tahiti, and so when did that, when did you start to travel, like to chase swells as well? You know, was that, you know, you moved there when you're 16, obviously you gotta try and earn some money, save some money, um, and with limited help, because I'm guessing at that time you probably didn't have any sponsors, right, to really help at that stage. So when when were you able to start to maybe like branch out from just staying in Hawaii and, and going to some other places? Yeah, just trying to work as hard as I can, save money. And then um, Tahiti was always um, like a dream destination, just like the North Shore was. But uh, I felt like for my appetite, like I've always been attracted to three waves. And um, uh, the first wave, Pipeline, second wave, Jaws, and the third wave, Chopo. So it's been a lifelong journey for me to get there and, and to those like dream destinations. But um, yeah, my brothers um, have gone to Tahiti back in the day and um, they made a name for themselves and kind of just like told me how awesome it was. So I've always just been fixated on big barrels. That's kind of like what drives me. That's what I train for. That's what I sacrifice. And yeah, so yeah, I mean, Tahiti was like huge. Yeah, yeah. Because I, because I, you won the. I mean, I'd have to imagine that that the wave of the winter was probably the most important moment in your surfing career up until that time. Was that if I'm remembering correctly, 2016 or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 2016, an incredible wave at Backdoor, which got- Off the wall. Oh, off the wall. So it got, it got you wave of the winter and 20, 20, I think 20 grand, 25 grand. Yep, so that was the most money I ever had. 
um, at the time for sure it was like life changing, um, zero to hero. So having some money, being able to make moves, I saved that money. I bought surfboards, plane tickets, paid rent and bought nutrition. So I invested it all back into Mikey Red. Um, yeah, it's so thankful for Surfline and, and that platform and, and being able to win that was like a dream come true. And it was a lot of work, blood, sweat, and tears um, sacrificed into that, that special wave. Um, so yeah, just some, that definitely was the life changing career moment for me. All of a sudden I had a profile. So yeah, that's kind of like being here on the North shore. That's what I work towards. Like not always invited to the contest or, or, you know, it's a struggle. So to win that was like, it was it was so refreshing. Yeah, it's incredible. Like you just, you know, that we were talking about before, like that all those times of going out and not getting waves and just trying and trying and never giving up and then all of a sudden getting that wave. And and we've seen it before with many people, like one wave just starts a career at, at pipe, off the wall, back door. You know, it's incredible how one wave can really just kickstart someone's, someone's career. But uh, it seemed like for, for you after that, that kick started into, um, yeah, and, and the, you know, the, the crazy thing is that 25 grand, 20 grand, it's, it's, it seems Nothing. like such a lot of money, but it's not, it goes you know, it it's goes like when you've got to travel and you've got to try and reinvest in yourself, you know, it really, pay rent, yeah. buy food, put gas. Yeah. Like, it's, it's there's a lot of things year, that come you know? first. Yeah. Before the whole, surfing fun work part and then <clears throat> and then you got picked up by uh volcom right so that was a sort of a transition from it seemed like volcom did a really cool thing they went and picked up a bunch of um you know local guys i think it was uh you and like you mikey bruno um kalani chapman right they they supported a bunch of the the local guys and and got you guys and what what year was that was that like two years ago three years ago yeah, that was um, 2017. I got on the Volcom team and family. Um, that that was a huge uh, opportunity and still is a huge opportunity, which I'm beyond grateful for. Uh, the whole, you know, Volcom house being at Pipeline, they uh, came at us as Pipeline surfers and, and offered us an opportunity, myself and four others, and it was uh, a no brainer, right? Like dream come true. So I just, um, with this opportunity, I just like, you know, I'm, I'm still in my twenties. So I'm really like, it just really was gas to the flame to work hard and, and be out there to try and make even more of a name for myself and be on the best waves out of pipeline, and, you know, just get straight to work. Yeah. Well, you know, and I've seen it, Mikey, you know, like I've seen you invest. I mean, you know, you've been working really hard with Kahaya Heart, um, you know, training, you know, I've, I train with you guys there sometimes and I've seen you putting in the hard work and I think it's a really um, a good thing for any kids listening is that, you know, if you really want something bad enough, you know, it's, it's, you've just got to dedicate and focus and, and train and, and just not give up that, that ultimate, dream or goal whether or not you achieve it um or not you know to to have something that you're so you know like the eddie i think like you said all the kids growing up in hawaii like the, for me the eddie was a dream and i was in this tiny little town in australia you know but i watched the eddie video and knew about hawaii and was like i want to i want to be in the eddie and like, it was just so ridiculously far from like reality like my friends just looked at me like i was an alien you know what i mean they're like you're an idiot mate. like as if you're gonna be in the eddie you know what i mean and it was just but you just you dream you're you're, you're, you're i'm a dreamer I, like deep down i'm just a big dreamer whether or not they become reality i feel like dreaming and having massive goals there's nothing wrong with that you know and because whether or not you get it or not, it, it allows you to focus and train and hone in on something. And, and that's a good thing in life is to have something to really work for. Yeah, for sure. So thankful for, for this life I was given and, and 
the dream yeah not giving up and and it definitely it depends on the individual and and if you love it or not you're gonna follow it yeah i mean you've been around so long like you're only 20 you just say 28 yeah yeah i mean god man you got so you know hopefully cross our fingers you know that pandemic and all that bullshit and the eddie will come back and you got so many more years to work yourself into that event you know and um you know as growing up in hawaii i can imagine that would just be the ultimate dream and goal is to get on that list you know thank you bro yeah i look up to you you're you're as bad as they come you're one of the best so you know to be around you and learn from you guys like you is is pretty i feel pretty lucky and fortunate and um of course eddie and eddie aikau and the family legacy and yeah i hope i i I can live up to the hype and and yeah get in there and and make a difference and ideally win yeah for sure yeah talk about life changing (laughs) winning the eddie and talk about life changing that would be incredible so let's when, go. Yeah, let's go, man. And then um, or Jaws. What like, Jaws? I yeah, I was about to say Jaws. When did um? Because I know it's you know I, I started to see you make your way to Jaws, start to be over there on the on the best swell. So when did that become a focus for you as well? Yeah. So Jaws has been like you know constantly uh, inspiring me my whole life. When I was a kid, as a young teenager, even eleven years old. Like, all I wanted to do was tow in the jaws, like, be out there, you know. My idol, Ikaika Kalama and Garrett McNamara, they're the best team. Uncle Boogie on the cliff, like, Garrett got the wave, you know. Freaking, it's a teamwork thing. So, I was always attracted to jaws ever since I can remember. Like I said, those three waves have inspired me and dictated all my moves. So, yeah, like, you know, just trying to balance the life and, and here on the North Shore with um, all these epic waves. But sometimes you got to like forget about these epic waves and go to the big mama. Yeah. So, yeah, that's where, you know, like pipeline jaws, one wave can change your life. And that's kind of the person I am. Yeah. Looking for those life changing waves. Life changing waves, yeah. Yeah. So let's 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 talk about Jaws. We'll go let's talk about that this year. Um you went out it was the swell I think it was the swell that the outer reefs were firing here. Um and yeah, take us through. I think I mean Surfline already did a, a little piece on you talking about that five wave beatdown, but for people that haven't seen that Let's uh, have a have a have a little chat. Hey there, let's talk about um, that whole from takeoff to by the time you got picked up. Yeah, freaking, it was no walk in the park. Let me tell you that. Uh, just to like you know wax your board and as you know to paddle out into the lineup, you're you're risking everything. So yeah, just some um, the day before was. Colossal, everybody is towing in and getting those huge waves. And, um, you know, on the North Shore, John John guys towing, are paddling into Himalayas and getting those huge barrels, Kaivi Berry. That was super inspiring. But, yeah, just um, being a part of that huge Saturday um, was like, it was, it was overwhelming. Yeah, there were so many big waves and... Um, yeah, not really having um everything organized like a jet ski and a driver and just basically being on a boat, but also like hitchhiking. So kind of just trying to wait my turn and and uh, stay calm at the same time. But ended up getting some sick waves some um, Saturday thanks to Daniel and Kelly. E. That was a life changing day, like just to be a part of that and and watch all the historic waves and rides go down. That was really motivating and inspiring. But um, come to Sunday when I caught one wave in the paddle session and uh, didn't even make it halfway down and uh, just ended up face planning and kind of knocked out on impact. And um, so that made everything kind of somewhat 
a little more handleable to endure the whole next five waves on the head. What was that, Mikey? You said that you actually you actually feel like you you blacked out or got knocked out on the impact when you fell. Yeah, yeah 100%. Wow. On impact, I knocked out. And then um, within like five moments or so, kind of getting sucked up in the lip, then started coming to kind of gathering my senses back. And then, yeah, just getting throttled by that one. And uh, somehow being knocked out made it a little more easy. And not so like scary because you're not as you're just... not as um I've had I've had that happen as well. You're not you're sort of out of it, so you're nearly more relaxed. You're not freaking out as much, and it's a you know I mean obviously you don't want to be knocked out, but sometimes the world works in wonderful ways and weird ways that it maybe helped a little bit. Yes, because there is so much energy still from the day prior. The swell was so strong still. It wasn't. It dropped in a lot of the, you know, the, the size dropped a lot from the day before, but still with a lot of those waves, it had that energy. So when I fell, it was, uh, it was super gnarly. And, um, yeah, just, uh, um, ended up coming to kind of like during the white, during the pounding of underwater, I didn't get a chance to, to pull my life jacket as it was like so violent. And, uh, I was just trying to really stay calm and, and endure what was coming next because you never know yeah so um once i popped up and surfaced from that first wave or the, the wipeout then um the second wave was like right there and it was i had no time to even prepare just just wore it on the head basically and and got throttled by that one and ended up getting to pull my vest and finally inflated and helped my my uh nerves relax and calm down a lot and then um, ended up taking three more. So yeah, I was uh, three more on the head. I was physically uh, exerted. I'd never really felt that um, drained, tired or drained before ever without like, you know, getting knocked out or unconscious after. So um, I ended up like fumbling the jet ski and the rescue with my board, the 10 foot board and the turbulence, just like not really being all there. So um, I ended up missing two rescues and then thank God, like right before I ended up getting smashed on the rocks, Curtis and uh, I linked up where, you know, he rescued me and got me to safety because it wasn't looking good where, where the area I was headed. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so he brought me back to the boat where I had all my stuff and um, that's when it was just like reality was sinking in and I was like tunnel vision was was starting to happen and I, I felt like I was just all I wanted to do was close my eyes and go to sleep so that was kind of a scary feeling um I don't know if you guys have head injuries before but yeah so when I felt super tired and all I wanted to do was sleep I knew that was a bad idea so I I tried to organize some things and take off my wetsuit to where I was like you know yeah. relax and stop hyperventilating and, and getting exhausted from all that heat and and breathing so um yeah i got to the boat and and things kind of turned around there when i ended up hydrating and, and getting a lot of magnesium and 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 um vitality back into life yeah everything. so yeah man it's not it's no it's no it's no game the old jaws it's uh god man it's yeah. such a heavy wave it's uh yeah, yeah you I want, had one of the, or a bunch yeah. of the worst wipeouts. So, you know, yeah, like, you know, it's just it's 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 one of those things. You know, it's it's not it's not if it's when. You know, if you if you play the game out there and you're looking to looking to get a good wave or a big one, it's eventually you're gonna get caught or you're gonna you know make a mistake or pick the wrong wave or whatever whatever it may be. It's just it's 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 inevitable and uh, it's inevitable. But it's how you deal with it, you know, and it's how the preparation, like you say, is that it's the training and um, are you hydrated before the day and and all that stuff. If you get, did you get a good night's sleep, you know, all that stuff can I think can. Like if you that just just what you said then sounded like when you're listening to like a UFC, you know, like I, lo I love watching the UFC countdown shows and all the after interviews and and you see the guys that have cut too much weight and they dehydrate themselves so much and they they get uh, they get clipped 
and it mightn't be by a big shot or anything, but it's uh, but their brain has no fluid on it, and it just they just lights out. You know, they're able to get knocked out a lot easier because they um, dehydrated themselves. You know, and I feel like as surfers and stuff, we do that all the time. You know, it's not as it's obviously is nowhere near as bad as losing thirty pounds in three days, but. But, you know, if you've been surfing, say, you know, those days where you've been surfing, it's been pumping on the North Shore for a week and you've just surfed pipe the, the night before and you jump on a flight and go over and not a good night's sleep, jump in the boat. You know what I mean? Like that's that's a recipe for, you know, to be um, not at your best. Hot you know? off guard. Yeah, you yeah. know, and, and, and you know, and, 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 you know, and transitioning into the pipeline wipeout, I guess, you know, it's it's like what effect did that, knockout at jaws have on you know when you 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 hit your head there you know so let's i mean let's that's a perfect transition so let's let's go back to the val uh, the valentine's day um swell at pipe and let's just let's just I'm not sure if you've talked about it yet or before but yet but let's just talk us through the day let's just start like start off because it was a pretty big hype swell and um, let's just start off on how that day started off for you and, and we'll roll through the scenario of what happened. 100%. So, yeah, um, uh, the Valentine Swell Pipeline, um, first thing in the morning, checking the waves, uh, it's going off. So, getting the, everything's all organized, we're ready, you know, just kind of um, trying to watch the line up and study which waves you want to catch, where you want to catch them. And uh, that's my normal routine, kind of just looking for what I want to get and where I'm going to get. So ended up having a, a, a great first session. Um, ended up scoring uh, two nice barrels, one left, one right, and uh, a couple other successful rides. So um, by that time, it was lunchtime, and I was ready to refuel fuel and trying to time it with the crowd is, is always a uh, hard so yeah just picking the right window but on these uh special swells or special days it's it's usually good all day so trying to gauge um you know how you feel with the crowd and and what you received already trying to also be really thankful and content for the gifts that you know were given um because like i said it's life and death so yeah always um it's a high stress environment out there um Came in, got lunch, probably should have just stayed out there because uh, the window of going in wasn't the right call. Um, yeah, the waves are firing all the way through, so that was a little um, head trip. But refueled, got back out there. Um, just before getting back out there, sitting on the beach with Flynn and Keone Nozaki, a bunch of the boys, Eala, Kala, uh, just evaluating it. Um, as uh, just before, like paddling out, had all my sunscreen, my helmet on, um, a little onshore kind of came in. There was a little sea breeze and, and kind of a lot of people started coming in and uh, it was still barreling. So, you know, just trying to study it and, and make the right call, but ended up paddling back out there as the little texture was, was challenging for, for everybody, but that's sometimes that's the window yeah so you want to be out there and uh you know do the best you can but so i don't really re have a recollection from um seeing the wave or even like paddling out i remember being on the beach with the boys and saying goodbye to my girlfriend and just you know preparing for battle yeah got out there um it was probably around five or ten minutes sometimes you wait four hours sometimes the wave comes in 30 seconds so just trying to be ready at the right place the right time and uh paddle your ass off so i ended up i think the wave came on um, i seen that it was a right and um i love going right it's uh but on those big days um where it's like you know six to twelve feet the rights are, are pretty treacherous and a lot of them are all closeouts and then the, you know, the current and everything, the reef, it's just no man's land. I have a slight memory of, of falling on the wave, kind of like just seeing a beautiful runway and, and, um, I was already swan diving by then and, uh, on impact again, knocked out. So quick flash, getting sucked over the falls came to for a second 
my last thought I remember having was, oh no, this is not good. And then I have no recollection. Wow. So, so, and, and for most people that have, that, that's, it's worst case scenario at pipeline, right? Cause you, you're, you're in the peak, you're right in the apex and you, we see it all the time where guys are too late or whatever, like that famous Andy Irons ones where he's like trying to get out the back and get sucked over with the lip, but you fell and do you, was it the impact from the reef, do you think, or just the impact of just that hitting the, hitting the water that flashed you out? Do you, can you remember that or? Um, I think a lot had to do with it. A, a lot of it had to do with um, my wipe out of Jaws. So I was still coming back from that. And then on impact, I hit the water first. And that's what knocked me out again. And then coming over, straight down into the reef but you were but you come to you you came to as you were getting sucked over just for a little bit for one thought for one thought and then it was all black no euphoric moment no white light just straight <laughs> out and um uh my next kind of memory is just being on the beach um you know on the stretcher on the backboard and and all the lifeguards and everybody all my rescuers like um surrounding me so when i woke up i was straight like you know i didn't know where i was who i was why everybody was so freaked out and and um yeah a lot of um yeah just looking at everybody's facial expressions and and uh being held down they they wanted to make sure my spine was okay and put me in a neck brace but um i think because i was in shock and and because the near drowning experience and all the water in my lungs I uh, I felt like I was still drowning. So when everybody was crowding me and kind of like talking to me, uh, it was so much. There was too much going on. Uh, it claustrophobic. You felt like you was probably just like, just, yeah. Drowning. I felt like I was drowning. So I was, all I wanted was space. I couldn't catch my breath. And um, yeah, I was basically just fighting for my life. Um, a lot of lifeguards, um, Kyle Foyle, Dave Wassel, Jesse, uh, Tamayo, like, yeah, thank God for all of um, my rescuers and, and these professionals that risk their life to, you know, put themselves in harm way to, to save guys like me. Um, and then, of course, all the other surfers, the first responders that seen me, Joaquin, uh, Leo, Max, like, it's such a brotherhood, our big wave surfing community. So without all these, like, angels and yeah. rescuers, like, I probably wouldn't be here. So let's 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 go back. I want to go from obviously you can't remember, but I want to. Uh, you've probably seen the footage, I imagine. I've watched it back, and you've had people probably tell you what have, what what happened. Can you try uh, to the best of your ability? Obviously, like once you hit the second time and was knocked out, have you do you understand the process of events now from from that to getting to the beach? Can you go through that for us? Yeah, so um, I, I just from watching the videos and hearing stories, I haven't really like dissected it too much. I just know I made a bad mistake and it's life yeah. and death out there. So I'm, I'm really like having no recollection is also a blessing. Yeah. But um, yeah, so um, thank God for uh, the helmet. Um, yeah. Because my head went straight into the reef. My helmet is messed up. No, you think so? This that... side of my head. On this side of my helmet, it's all scratched up. There's a quarter size indention, like where I definitely would have had uh, like a hole in my head. So, and then all the scratches and stitches, staples, whatever would have happened, like would have been much more severe. So, um, yeah, the, it was second reefing that day. Uh, so I think um, Joaquin was the first surfer, first responder to, to really notice um that I didn't come up and my board was tombstoning again. Thank God for the leash and that not, you know, breaking because then it would have been a whole nother scenario. But, um, yeah, Joaquin, I, I heard he was really like, he didn't stop looking and paying attention to my wipeout and my board. So he knew that I didn't surface and he was the first guy to come in. And, um, then there were several others, but, uh, Joaquin, Max Beach, and uh, Leo Friervanti, I, I think, were the first guys to actually get to my body and, and hang on to me 
through the impact zone and, and all those second reef sets. So like maybe, you know, without them holding on to me, my leash would have broke or who knows what would have happened. But those guys holding on to me and, and ideally like trying to get my head above water. So, you know, brain damage doesn't severely kick in. Um, yeah, it's all time, time, time. So those guys were so fast and so on it. And like, yeah, I've been around a lot of um, accidents out there. I've been a first responder to Dusty Payne. I've, I've, I've watched Kalani uh, catch his wave. And I was right there during that whole rescue scenario and, and not actually being uh, help, just like, realizing like the severity of it and then also realizing that what could I do like there was already Uncle Terry and Nathan and Seth already fishing them out of the water so I felt like you know me going into that extreme situation would have just almost been more chaotic or more worse so yeah just um being around there or being around uh, big waves you see all these like it, it just happens time after time so it's not if, like you said, it's when. Um, yeah, so um, by that time, the three, those four, three guys that got to me first, um, they ended up taking like a 10, 12 footer on the head and, and somehow hung on to me through all that turbulence and impact zone. And then the next wave of surfers, um, you know, Uncle Mike and uh, Arjuna coming in from Second Reef. And then also guys coming off the beach, um, Billy Kemper, Zeke Lau, Cole Rothman, like, uh, by the grace of God, Billy caught a backwash out from the beach to me, directly to me. So, um, just, yeah, so thankful and so, um, so just, yeah, so, so thankful to be alive and, and for all those guys that, that responded and, and acted in, in that life and death situation because, a lot of times when you see that stuff like going on, like it, you're going to risk your life. And, and, and so that being said, you know, you just want to be calculated and, and hope for the best possible outcome. You're preparing for the worst, but hoping for the best. And, uh, yeah, there's so much luck and, and mother nature, like she turns on, she turns off, she, she gives and she takes. So. Yeah. And then, so then you, you get to the beach and obviously the, the, the North Shore lifeguards, you know, take over, they grab you, they probably, you know, make sure your spine, backs, everything's, you know, drag you up the beach, carry up the beach. And then at this stage, you're still out, right? You're unconscious. They, they start working on you. Yeah. So I was out um, until getting to the beach, I believe. Uh, um, I don't know who it was who gave me chest compressions, maybe Kyle Foyle or Dave, but yeah, um, from when the jet ski Jesse got to me and um, the surfers that were, you know, hung on to me, um, finally getting fished up onto the jet ski, got beached with those guys and, and yeah, chest pressure compressions began and um, that's when life came back to me. Uh, it literally was, yeah, I, I, I've um, had a lot of like euphoric moments before in the past and and being out this time, there was nothing. There was no lights. There was it was just darkness, and and then all of a sudden, like it was reborn and and reawakening. Life was just you know giving back to me, and um those the uh, those guys like because when you knock out underwater or hit the reef, like your body is limp, so you're being ragdolled. And normally when we wipe out, like you're kind of tense, you know, you don't want your limbs to break off or your bones to break. So you, your body surfing your, to your best ability, but being underwater, not tense, being limp, you know, ragdoll mode. Um, that's when the lifeguards and everybody like thought, you know, a, a first, some um, instinct is like, you know, protect the spine and the neck. So, so, um, yeah, they were trying to put me on the backboard and, and, uh, put my neck into the brace. And uh, I wasn't having none of it. It wasn't like intentional. It was just like felt like um, I'm fighting for my life. I didn't know where I was, who I was, and who these people were. Just like it was a lot. So um, yeah, once the the life was given back to me, it was it was um, huh, pretty uh, intense and for sure. Like my girlfriend was there and her friends. So 
thank God, like, for, you know, those rescuers, the guardian angels, but also all the prayers and good vibes. Like, there's a lot of people that that just started praying, and, and I, I'm, I believe in God heavily uh, and the higher power, you know, so I offer myself up to God and just, like, I'm in deep gratitude and yeah. I'm so thankful to be here. And how how long how long did it take you to sort of you know you come back to life like life's given back to you and then you like you said you felt like you were still drowning and everyone you know you just wake up to this everyone crowding you and the, how long did it take you to sort of just get a grip of like holy shit like okay now I'm starting to sort of understand what's happened I'm sort of able to like relax a little bit more and just sort of like yeah I, because it must have been a, a crazy situation. Yeah, I wasn't able to relax at all for even still right now. I'm, yeah. I'm still in a lot of trauma and, you know, from the two TBIs that like really severely messes with you. So, um, yeah, just some um, life was given back to me on the beach and all my friends were there and I could see their eyes and their facial expressions and people were shook, you know, and there was... There was a lot of people that were still positive and like giving me uh positive like hope, you know, because yeah, freaking um so I yeah, leaving the beach, I, I don't know who I left the beach with. I, I wasn't able to really walk by myself, but I tried to stand up and thank God Pomai and 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 the boys like really carried me up to the ambulance and and uh I got into the ambulance and I just remember being so thirsty, like mm. uh like the worst wow crazy thirst that i've ever like yeah just was so thirsty and and all the um professionals were were telling me no don't drink water no because the, secondary the drowning, drowning can yeah. occur so i didn't really understand that and i wasn't having any of it so i made my girlfriend give me water and and it was literally like uh the fountain of youth right there <laughs> Um, there was so much water in my lungs, so I couldn't really like take a breath and 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 recover. So um, got into the ambulance and I was just coughing up salt water and blood and and uh, from the pulmonary edema that just yeah shook me so hard. But um, all my friends ended up being there right at the the ambulance and it was right there at Eukai and and kind of like. They were all just giving me so much hope and encouragement and, and uh, that really meant the world to me, uh, seeing their facial expressions and and gave me a lot of hope to, you know, hang in there because I was out of it, still out of it, still trying to just, you know, take it day by day, moment yeah. by moment. But um, yeah, so kind of um, the, I remember the ambulance doors closing and seeing Landon's, uh, Landon McNamara's face and he just gave me so much hope and encouragement. He, he was so positive and his spirits were up and a lot of people's facial expressions are just like, they're shook, you know? So yeah. looking at those facial expressions wasn't really helping me out, but then the people who were staying positive and giving me hope that, yeah, like that meant the world to me. Yeah. Man, what a story, Mikey, man. God said, you know, it's just uh, the the beauty and the beast of pipeline, right? You know, you, you look at it and go, yeah, it's so crowded. There's so many people, but you know what? Imagine if there was only five guys out, you know, like it's, I'm sure you've gone, you know what I mean? Like lucky that, lucky that there were so many guys there, so many people there and so many people that, uh, have probably done the give a shout out to the brag the BWAG course you know that all these surfers that have done done all these training and, and understand like how important it is to be that first responder you know and uh, as gnarly as pipeline is it's may, 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 maybe the best best place to get hurt you know because the lifeguards are, cl are so, so close and there's so many people in the water and n nearly everyone knows what to do you know and um yeah, right. heavy shit. Yeah. So yeah, huge um huge thank you to the big the brag class and you know Daniello and Cole and Sion and all the guys that paved their paved the way because Uncle Brian and all the watermen out there. And and to to you young guys and to you guys thinking about, you know, signing up for this whole, you know, lifestyle. Um, let me tell you, it should be a requirement for you to to 
go through life saving skills classes and and to to re up your skills and and to learn CPR and just do the basics, you know, the C spine and do what you can because if I see you out there and uh, yeah, you don't look confident or you know you're not. You don't have the squip skills to be out there. I'm going to tell you straight, get the fuck out of here. Because it's not only your life that is in jeopardy. It's guys like me. So, yeah, I really take it. I take every precaution seriously. Like, I've been a junior lifeguard since before I was a teenager. My siblings are lifeguards. Um, all my heroes are first responders. My mom, you know, working in the hospital, the ICU. She's a nurse in ICU for 40 years over in Hilo and yeah so for me just having that background I feel really fortunate but the learning never ends and uh it's uh it's constant you always want to just surround yourself with with people who know what they're doing and and have the skills to save your life because yeah yeah life and death good 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 words mate good words what and so <laughs> Just, you know, in, in, in summary, how are you feeling now? Um, you know, what, you know, are you, the doctors say you're going to make a full recovery. What's the, what's the recovery process look like for you now? Yeah. So, um, uh, just, uh, yeah, taking it day by day. Like I said, um, I still feel I'm pretty jacked up. My body still feels pretty ragged all. My spine is like, thank God everything is like, you know, I, I have all my teeth. I have no broken bones. I have no lacerations. All my limbs are intact. So I'm just so grateful for all these, um, yeah, the, those rescuers and God and everybody that, you know, said those prayers because I know how, how, um, how easily life can slip away. So, um, yeah, yeah life's man. a trip. Your life's a trip. <laughs> All right, Mikey. Well, we usually I usually finish the podcast with five questions. Um, I think I'm, I think I'm, I know what question two is going to be, but I'm going to ask you anyway. So, what's the, what number one is? What's the best big wave in the world? Oh, for sure, hands down, our Jaws is the best big wave in the world. Like Pacific Ocean, warm water, and big, huge pits. Yeah, uh, I mean, from what I've come across, you know, I'm like. Um, and you and yeah. probably all the world's best big wave surfers will tell you the same thing. Yeah. Um, what's the heaviest big wave in the world? Scariest. I mean, scariest, heaviest, most, most death-defying wave is obviously pipeline. The most deaths have yeah. occurred out there. The most near deaths. And so, yeah, just I think that's, 100%. Yeah, I think that pipeline. was, yeah. Um, most underrated big wave in the world? Oh, there's so many of those underrated big waves. Um, anywhere really not on the North Shore is kind of an underrated big wave because like literally the North Shore is the only place where the conditions get that good in that amount of time. You know, eight months out of the year, the waves are going off. So yeah, anywhere, uh, there's a lot of places. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, what's one? What's one like, big wave that you haven't surfed that you would really like to, to, to tick off the bucket list? Oh yeah. There's a handful of those too, but, um, yeah, just growing up in Hawaii, I feel really, um, lucky to have all these, you know, awesome waves in my backyard. But, um, the waves that I really like to experience later on in my life are definitely, there's a lot in Australia and a lot in Fiji or there's a ton of waves that, that really, uh, spark my appetite cloud break um, yeah ship sterns all right just you know doing what i can while i'm here and hopefully if if the stars align maybe one day i'll be lucky enough to get over there yeah cool and the last one is um where do you think uh you know we're always looking for new big waves and but i always ask the guys and girls like what do you think where do you think the next big wave discovery will be you know like how nazare just sort of like flash onto the map like where's the next spot that the maybe the next nazare you think may be Whew, yeah the world is a is a beautiful place with so many uh coastlines and so many mm -hmm. different you know places that storms open up to I'm not really like trying to find new waves, so yeah. I'm not really, you know, in that search. But whew, there's probably a ton of waves that are 
not discovered yet. And, and yeah, I look forward to maybe being able to surf those too. Yeah, buddy. Well, Mikey, I think I, you know, you know, vouch for everyone saying that we're so stoked you're still with us. Um, so stoked you're wearing a helmet. I mean, I, from what it sounds like, I think the helmet probably saved your life for sure. Um, or, you know, just made it a lot less gnarly than what it would have been, you know, without, without that helmet. And uh, thank you to all the first responders. Thank you to the North Shore lifeguards. I mean, guardian angels for sure. If you've ever been over here in Hawaii, you know that the red and yellow um, they're bad. real superheroes they're, they're badass but um, Mikey uh, wish you a full recovery buddy can't wait to see you back in the gym back in the water and um, thanks for thanks for opening up and sharing your story I really appreciate it right on Jamie thank you um, it was a pleasure it was an honor to be on your podcast and and uh, see you see you in the water alright brother thank you right on everybody aloha